Hey everyone, my name is Chris Anderson. Chemistry can tell us a lot about the world around us. It can tell us how animals live, what they eat, and what threats they're facing. Which is why I'm here at the University of Cincinnati to talk to Dr. Brooke Crowley, who uses chemistry to answer mysteries about the natural world. So my name is Brooke Crowley, and I am an associate professor I'm in the departments of geology and anthropology at the University of Cincinnati. I think of myself sort of as an ecological detective. What I do is I use chemistry to answer questions about animals, um, both that are alive today and that were alive in the past and are now extinct. Geochemistry is a really great tool for being able to actually like reconstruct the diet of a species that's now extinct or reconstruct the kind of environment in which it lived. I have parents who are both very interested in science, and I have a father who was a high school and middle school science teacher. But I've, I've always had a deep curiosity and interest and love for being outdoors and knowing more about the natural world. Hey, Brooke. Oh, hi, Chris. How's it going? It's super. So you are a detective, a yes. chemistry detective. Yes. What kind of mysteries are you solving these days? So I've worked in Madagascar now and with Madagascar uh, for over a decade. And I've, I've answered all sorts of questions about the animals that live there today and that used to live there in the past. So what's, uh, what are some of the issues that Madagascar is facing and that you're trying to help solve? Well, there's very little of the natural vegetation left. So estimates are somewhere around 16% of the forest cover that was there before people arrived, which is a dramatic decline. Um, and there's been a lot of recent extinctions. And so some, some of the kinds of research I have been doing have been answering questions about what those extinct species ate, the kind of environments in which they lived, when they went extinct. Um, and so I've uh, pieced together a puzzle about not just lemurs. So there's a lot. So lemurs are the primates of Madagascar. I forgot to mention that. So they only live on Madagascar. And there's today over 100 species that have been recognized. Okay. Wow. But everything bigger than 10 kilograms went extinct by about 1,000 years ago or so. And that includes at least 15 species of extinct lemur. It's big guys. There was a, a lemur the size of a gorilla. Oh, that's but, a. Yeah. That's a, <laughs> yeah. That's a today big, everybody's that's a small, lemur. but there were, there were big lemurs in the past. There were also uh, yes. hippopotamuses that were native to Madagascar and giant tortoises and a number of other kind of more enigmatic bizarre critter critters. So how do you go about answering these questions? What, what kind of what kind of data do you do you take when you're in the field? Well I work mostly especially with the extinct animals I work with bone or we, we collect material from museum collections. So this and we, is a this is a uh, bone from a lemur? Yes this is a little fragment of bone from a lemur. Okay. And so I, I get sent little bits of bone or I collect them in a museum and then I do some chemical processing to isolate a certain component of the bone, and usually it's the protein. But I would estimate that it's somewhere between five and 10,000 years old based oh, wow. on the ages of other things that we've gotten from this particular site. So you, uh, you collect these samples, you got in the field, you collect these bone samples. Yep. And you look at their proteins. So what do you look for that, tell, that can tell you about, about their lives? Well, specifically, I look um, when I'm looking at bone protein, I look at carbon and nitrogen in the bone. Okay. And I use isotopes um, of the carbon and nitrogen to interpret kind of the diet that they eat and the kind of habitat in which they lived. Can you show me how you how you measure this? Um, would you like to see the instrument? I would love to see the instrument. Yeah, sure, I can do that. So this is called an elemental analyzer, and um, we call it an EA for short. And so the way this works is there is a wheel up here that has 50 little holes in it. Okay. And we can put little samples in those holes. And in order to keep our samples um, sort of separate and clean, we wrap them in little tiny tin boats. It's like tin foil. Oh. And we use these trays to keep it organized. So there's little pieces of bone in the tin foil. Yes, indeed. Okay. Yep. Yep. So we carefully will put those in the little wheel. Okay. And then we, um, as the machine um, runs, it advances one at a time and drops one sample down. Now this is a tube here okay. that takes us into a furnace. When it's running, is at 1,000 degrees Celsius. So oh. it's very effective for burning up little tiny things. And the tin actually helps um, the sample combust completely. Okay. We then pass the sample through a column that's filled with copper, and that removes oxygen. And we really just want to end up with nice, clean carbon dioxide gas and nitrogen gas okay. for running on the mass spec. All right, so you take these little pieces of bone, you drop them in the wheel. Yep. They burn at 1,000 degrees Celsius, 
and they turn into carbon dioxide and nitrogen gas. Yep, and then it passes through the tube for a little longer and eventually it gets sent over to the mass spec where we measure the ratio of 13C to 12C and the ratio of 15 nitrogen to 14 nitrogen okay. to look at those isotopes in those particular elements. So now we're looking at the mass spec. So this is essentially the brain of the instrument. Okay. The elemental analyzer, we're looking at the back of it over here. Okay. And there's little tubes, which are, that's actually where the sample would pass, these little metal tubes. They oh. eventually come, yep, there. So your sample passes as a gas through all of that and eventually ends up in this instrument. Okay, this guy right here. And so what we have in here is we have the ability to ionize the gas and make it charged. Okay. And that, then we pass it through a magnet and across, like we shoot it down a tube and there's a magnet that bends the samples and it bends the samples depending on how much they weigh. How much they weigh. Yes. Okay, so that goes into, into those isotopes. So yes. what, what exactly are isotopes? So isotopes are different atoms of the same element okay. that have a different number of neutrons but the same charge. So they, they have the same number of electrons and the same number of protons. Okay. They just weigh slightly different amounts. Our typical isotopes that we use in the ecological context are um, oxygen. We use oxygen 18. In carbon, we use carbon 13, which has one more neutron than our normal carbon 12. Okay. We use nitrogen 15 versus nitrogen 14. So again, there's one neutron extra in nitrogen 15. Um, but that little extra mass makes the heavier isotope slightly more sluggish. So it reacts slightly slower. So what can those differences tell you about the samples that, you, that you've taken? Different isotopes have different sort of things that allow them to, that, like they're their strengths, if you will. Okay. And so the more isotopes we analyze, the more we can say about a system. So we expect to see more 15N relative to 14N for animals that eat more meat. So there's a trophic level effect. And for carbon, um, it can also tell us something about environment. So we also see different isotope ratios for carbon in dry and moist habitats or also in hot versus cold habitats. Um, but among animals that coexist, we may be able to see small differences between species that eat different diets. And then the other thing about carbon is it's very good for distinguishing habitats. Okay. So if you have animals living more in an open habitat like a savanna or in a closed forest environment, um, or within a forest, down on the forest floor versus up in the canopy, okay. those can have very distinct carbon isotope values. Okay, so the more, the more isotopes you are able to, to see the difference of the bigger picture that you yes. can paint with, with yep. what their world was like. Yes, exactly. So um, we often will use multiple different isotope systems to interpret the past. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs>of uh, ecosystems have you been able to reconstruct? In, in Madagascar specifically, we um, have been able to um, determine that in the past it was dry, very much like it is today on the west. Okay. So this idea about having long-term data is really important for understanding and the species that are still around today. So what we know is that Madagascar is highly modified. And what that means is that observation data for species that are around today in protected reserves may not be indicative of normal behavior. Well, thank you, Brooks, so much for showing me around your lab and telling me all the cool mysteries that you're solving with chemistry. It's really awesome the work you're doing. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for your interest. Thanks. And thank you for watching, and we will see you next time on Science Round Sensei. Hey, everyone. My name is Chris Anderson. Chemical about the world around us. I gotta do that again. I think it's, I think it's good for what we do here.